dangerous and the villain. Prince Harry's latest bombshell interview hones in on the Queen Consort. The fractured nature of his family has become ever clearer as he accuses Camilla of leaking stories to journalists. That made her dangerous because of the connections that she was forging within the British press. And there was open willingness on both sides to trade of information. The Prince also claimed Camilla sacrificed him to help rehabilitate her image. We'll have all the details also tonight. No end in sight yet for the recent run of strikes after the latest talks with the government go nowhere. England finally catches up with Wales and Scotland with a plan to ban single-use plastics and... Gareth Bale. Bang! Gareth Bale bails out, retiring from football after what he calls realising his dream. This is the ITV Evening News with Charlene White. Good evening. Prince Harry has exposed yet another deep rift within the royal family, this time between him and Camilla, the Queen Consort. In TV interviews to promote his controversial memoir, he claimed his stepmother had sacrificed him to help rehabilitate her image. The Duke described her as dangerous and revealed he hadn't spoken to her in a long time. Here's our royal editor, Chris Shipp. During their short time working in the royal family... <laughs> Harry and Meghan gave the impression in public that all was well between them and his stepmother. But now we know neither he nor William wanted his father to marry Camilla. And in interview after interview in the last 24 hours, Harry has accused the Queen Consort of forging what he called a dangerous relationship with the press. I want to sort of just briefly talk about your stepmother and the press. You say that your interests were sacrificed on her PR altar, to quote. Those certain members have decided to get into bed with the devil, right? To rehabilitate their image. Yeah. But the moment that that rehabilitation comes at the detriment of others, me, other members of my family, then that's where I draw the line. So what did he mean by getting into bed with the devil? She was the villain. Harry explained more in his conversation with American TV network CBS. How was she dangerous? Because of the need for her to rehabilitate her image. That made her dangerous? That made her dangerous because of the connections that she was forging within the British press. And there was open willingness on both sides to trade of information. Camilla's reputation after the death of Diana did indeed need repairing, and the palace worked on it for many years, from the first public engagement with Prince Charles in 1999 to their marriage in Windsor in 2005, with the apparent blessing, or so we were told at the time, of his sons. But what is not in doubt in all of Harry's new interviews, this one is Good Morning America, is that his relationship with his stepmother is, to put it mildly, complex. She had a reputation or an image to rehabilitate. And what is your relationship with Camilla now? We haven't spoken for a long time. Um, you know, I, I love every member of my family, despite the differences. So when I see her, we're perfectly pleasant with each other. You know, she's my stepmother. I don't look at her as an evil stepmother. The late Queen, Harry claimed, knew about it all, the depth of this family rift. And he says it even extended to the flight to Scotland on the day his grandmother died. I asked my brother, I said, what are your plans? How are you and Kate getting up there? Um, and then a couple of hours later, you know, all of the fam family members that live within the Windsor and Ascot area were jumping on a plane together, a plane with 12, 14, maybe 16 seats. You were not invited on that plane? I was not invited. No surprise to learn then that contact between Harry and his family is now non-existent. Do you speak to William now? Do you text? Uh, currently, no. Do you speak to your dad? We, aren't, we haven't spoken for quite a while. Um, no, not recently. He talks about reconciling, but all sides will agree this family has a lot of healing to do. Chris Shipp, ITV News. Well, Prince Harry also singled out the British press for the hurt it's done to him and his family. But his own actions may also have damaged how the public views the royal.
Prince Harry's claims are exposing the deep divisions at the heart of Britain's monarchy. Far from their role of bringing a nation together, these accusations are polarising opinion. Six years ago, they thought they were embarking on a life of royal service when they attended their first royal engagement in Nottingham. Today, we went back to find out what the public think of Harry and Meghan now. I was a supporter of them in the beginning, but now I think it's a bit too TV commercialised and bad-mouthing William and things, and I don't think that's going to come across very well. I think it's a great shame that he feels that uh, the royal family didn't support him the way he felt he ought to have been when he was very young, but I think to that extent one has uh, sympathy with him. If it was me, I wouldn't put it out there. We're not just talking about family relationships, we're talking about an antagonist. Again and again in his interview with ITV's Tom Bradby, Harry laid the majority of the blame for the family fallout the moment, I don't recognise them as the much British as they probably press. don't recognise, specifically the tabloids, who want to create as much conflict as possible. It was something that the British press created, the distorted narrative that was being pushed through the British press. And again today, Prince Harry and his revelations dominated the front pages. But this one-time royal editor insists she has a clear conscience. So you would say categorically that no stories were ever leaked to you about Harry and Meghan? I mean, I've given this so much thought. I would say categorically no negative story was ever planted with me, given to me. And I was the royal editor of The Mail on Sunday and The Sun, two of the biggest tabloids in Britain. And what about the Oprah interview and this claim from Meghan about an unnamed member of the royal family asking about baby Archie's skin colour? And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? Harry now says that wasn't about racism, but unconscious bias. I don't think that means that it kind of negates everything he has said about race being a factor, because I think race and unconscious bias are really, really part of the same narrative. Harry says he wants a royal reconciliation. It's hard to see that happening anytime soon. Sejal Karia, ITV News. Well, Chris Shipp has joined us in the studio. And Chris, it has been quite the 24 hours, hasn't it? it? Has. Yeah. Uh, so where do Harry and the royal family even go <sighs> from here? Where to begin? Um, look, uh, there is a school of thought, and I think uh, there will be a lot of families watching this thinking, how can you possibly come back from this? And I think that wouldn't be a terrible conclusion uh, to come to. Um, you know, but actually, when you think about what Harry said, particularly about this issue of, of race, he's taken kind of racism off the table. Now, you might criticise Harry and Meghan for why didn't we correct this narrative in the last two years, but he's now kind of taken that stinging criticism of the royal family uh, off the table. And, you, you know, it's entirely possible, and we heard Harry say they don't speak, they don't text, you know, no one invited Harry on the plane when they went up to see the Queen dying. You know, how do you come back from that? But, you know, it's, it's entirely possible they might find a way. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but now this is out there and we've had Netflix and we've had the book and everything else. Perhaps this is the time to draw the line and maybe think about moving forward. Well, we shall see. Chris, thanks very much. Well, you can find all the latest reaction to Prince Harry's interviews by scrolling down to the news section on ITVX. The full ITV interview is also available to watch. Talks with the government aimed at averting further pay strikes have failed to make a breakthrough. NHS and nursing unions called negotiations a missed opportunity and bitterly disappointing. Our political correspondent, Carl Dinan, is over at Downing Street for us. So, Carl, was there any progress today? That depends a little on who you talked to. I mean, there were discussions. Some unions say there were progress. There will be further discussions. Certainly none of the talks broke down, but there's been no resolution to any of the disputes. Now, the rail unions and the teachers union left their respective meetings saying they would have further negotiations. The health unions, though, who uh, met Steve Barclay, the health secretary, had very different things to say about their meeting. The Royal College of Nursing and Unite were very unhappy with it. But listen to what the Unison rep said uh, and how she characterised that meeting. It was a very civil meeting. We did actually manage to talk about pay. We didn't get the tangible concessions um, that we uh, might have hoped or that would enable us to call off the strikes later this week and, and next. Uh, but it was definitely a progress. 
Now, where I think that progress is centred around where there is at least some cause for hope, where there are a couple of ideas. One is the possibility of a one-off cost of living payment. The other is some kind of backdating of next year's pay settlement, perhaps to January in return for an agreement on productivity. There are some hurdles to that. None of it's been agreed by number 10 or the Treasury. Some of the unions, as you've said, really aren't happy with it in any case. And as things stand, all of the planned strikes are still going ahead. OK, Carl, thank you. Olympic cyclist Mark Cavendish has told a court how a large knife was held to his throat during a violent robbery at his home. Giving evidence, his wife Petter also relieved, uh, relived the ordeal. Ian Woods is at Chelmsford Crown Court for us. Um, Ian, what did the jury hear? Well, the couple were asleep with their three-year-old child when the intruders broke in. Four men wearing balaclavas came into their bedroom while they were naked. Mark Cavendish told the jury, straight away they started punching me in the head. One held me while the other pulled out a knife and held it to my face. Peter Cavendish choked up as she described how she hid her young child under the duvet uh, as the, uh, throughout the attack on her husband. Um, she said it was just everyone's worst nightmare. One of them held a large black knife to his throat and they said, where's the watches and do you want me to stab you in front of your kid? The robbers stole two limited edition Richard Meal watches worth a combined £700,000. The court heard that the Olympic cyclist was given the watches because he's a brand ambassador for the company. In the past, he's used his social media accounts to advertise the watches and it seems the robbers may have been looking for an even more expensive one that he'd been loaned. Two men are on trial for robbing the couple. A third man has pleaded guilty, while two other suspects are on the run. The watches have never been recovered. OK, Ian, thanks very much. And there's plenty more to come in the ICV Evening News, including... The plans to ban single-use plastic in England, but will it help cut pollution? Plus, the 747 set to make space history in Cornwall. See you after the break. Welcome back. Single-use plastic like cutlery, plates and trays we banned in England to help cut pollution. Billions are used and thrown away every year and only a fraction are recycled. The government is following similar bans already in place in Scotland and Wales. But as our consumer editor Chris Choi reports, there's a cost to businesses. The takeaway is quickly gone, but the plastic can be around a very long time. Now single-use plates and cutlery are to be banned in England. This cafe manager says alternatives can be twice the price. If we go up more expenses, so there's more expenses going up for us. So I tell you what, I mean, to be honest, more, people, more businesses, they will close down. Behind this whole issue, there's a stark fact. Wooden cutlery can decompose within two years. For plastic, it can be two centuries. Around a billion single-use plastic plates and more than four billion items of disposable cutlery are used annually in England, and yet only around 10% get recycled. This chip shop in Leeds already uses compostable alternatives, but a full conversion could cost the sector £90 million a year. My big concerns are the availability of the products. Uh, there's also no joined up thinking when it comes to recycling, so I think councils, local authorities need to get um, guidance on what consumers should do with packaging when, when they finish consuming it. At this food market today, plenty of plastic. The ban will include a range of items relating to takeaway food and drink, but campaigners say that's not enough. The UK government has a real responsibility to fix this plastics crisis, and it feels a bit like we're nibbling around the edges of a giant problem here by just banning a few different items. Similar bans for Scotland and Wales have already been announced as environmental regulations aim to take plastic off the menu. Chris Choi, ITV News. An investigation has begun in Brazil after thousands of supporters of the country's former president stormed a government buildings last night. The protesters were captured throwing furniture through windows of the presidential palace, flooding parts of Congress and ransacking the Supreme Court. Police say 300 people have been arrested. 
and police in Ukraine are searching for two British volunteers, according to the Foreign Office. The men were reported missing from Solodar, a city in the eastern Donetsk region, on Saturday. One, ICV News has learned, is Andrew Bagshaw. Wales captain Gareth Bale has announced his retirement from football at the age of 33. The star's glittering career has seen him win the Champions League five times and help his country qualify for their first World Cup in more than 60 years. Here's our Wales reporter, Rhys Williams. His talent was obvious from early on. Scoring his first goal for his country aged just 18, Wales fans couldn't possibly have predicted how this youngster from Cardiff would transform their fortunes. After signing for Tottenham Hotspur as a teenager, Gareth Bale developed a reputation for his blistering pace and for scoring sensational goals. It was a combination which saw him terrorise defences all over Europe for the North London team. It was scary. I mean, every time he picked the ball up, he'd run 60, 70 yards with the ball and whack it into the back of the net or cross it or do something amazing. It was just an amazing talent. Really laid back, quiet lad, quite shy. But when he got on the pitch and got the ball, off he went. He was unstoppable. After scoring nearly 50 goals for Tottenham, Bale was signed by Real Madrid for a world record transfer fee of £85 million in 2013. Uh, por esta gran acogida. Hala Madrid. His record there was remarkable and included five Champions League titles. In one final, he did this. But for Bale, nothing mattered more than Wales, who led them to a semi-final in their first major tournament in 58 years, before finally helping his beloved Cymru qualify for a World Cup earlier this year. Gareth Bale, bang! How fitting that this iconic player's last ever goal was for Wales and at the World Cup. Chris Williams, ITV News. And finally tonight, we stay with stars. Uh, Britain's first ever orbital space launch is getting ready for takeoff. The launch is set for some time after nine o'clock tonight from Newquay in Cornwall. A modified passenger jet will release a rocket taking nine satellites above Earth. Here's, how Martin, here's Martin Stu now on the giant leap for the UK space industry. Forget Cape Canaveral, today it's Cornwall on the cusp of a space adventure. We're just a few hours out from takeoff now of Cosmic Girl. I hope you're excited. All eyes to the skies to watch the first ever satellite launch from UK soil. There's no way you can miss this. It's such a monumental moment in British spaceflight history. School kids even begging their parents to stay up late to watch. Loads of us will be really happy. So we will get to watch it on TV and in school maybe. Yeah, it's suddenly just like mind-blowing and you're like, ah. This is a life-size replica of Launcher One, the rocket which is currently hanging underneath the plane. It's the length of two double-decker buses and the nine satellites, which are only the size of a shoebox each, actually all fit into the nose cone. It's what's called a horizontal launch, which means once Cosmic Girl, a converted jumbo oh. jet, gets to 35,000 feet, really? Launcher One will be dropped and then boosted to 17,000 miles per hour before depositing the satellites into orbit. A chance to tap into a multi-billion pound industry and tap up the next generation of astronauts. There's a saying that if you can't see it, you can't be it. So the fact that you know school kids from Cornwall can go down to Newquay Airport and actually see an industry that's on their doorstep that's crying out for young, fresh, new talent um, must be very exciting. Weather dependent, blast off, or rather take off, is 10.30 tonight. Martin Stew, ITV News. Right, that's it from us. You can see more on that launch on News at 10 right after the FA Cup football. Tom's here with that. But for me and the Evening News team, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.